Module 4, Microbial Testing. How to Selective and Differential Media. How to Differential Biochemical Tests. Selective and differential media can be used in the identification of organisms. In this demonstration, we will use three different organisms, E. coli, Staphylococcus aureus, and Staphylococcus epidermidis. On the left of the workplace, you'll see these organisms. They are not on streak plates. However, they are pure cultures. These were obtained by picking a single colony that was isolated from a previous streak plate and then simply streaking it onto a new non-selective plate. We will test using three different media, mannitol salt agar, blood agar, and McConkie agar. Their general properties are listed on the right. We must, of course, include a control plate. This will be triptych soy agar. The control plate is used to demonstrate that the organisms are all capable of growing under the conditions of the experiment. And thus, an absence of adequate growth would imply that the plate has selected against the growth of that organism. Start by sectioning out each plate. We have three specimens, so section into threes. Label each section with the name of the organism. Also include the date of the inoculation and your initials. The inoculation will be simple. Aseptically, you will remove a loop full of growth and simply streak it across the area named for that organism. You can repeat this for each plate without re-sterilizing your loop. Let's start with E. coli. Sterilize the loop and allow it to cool. Make sure that all of your test plates are orientated with E. coli at the top. Remove a sample and first inoculate the control. Watch how a simple streak is performed. We're inoculating with the same organism, so we do not strictly have to sterilize the loop again. Inoculate the region for E. coli again and repeat for the last two. The blood plate is inoculated last. Notice how at the end of the streak, the loop is pushed into the agar twice. This inoculation is slightly different. Reorientate all of the plates for the next organism and repeat the process. Work aseptically and remain organized. When the blood plate is inoculated, you'll notice again that the loop is pushed into the agar twice. The reason for this is that some organisms that produce a hemolysin that will degrade red blood cells can only work anaerobically. And so the enzyme, the hemolysin, is actually oxygen labile. By pushing the loop, into the agar, we have a low oxygen environment for growth, and so any oxygen labile -like enzymes will still be able to do their work if they're present.
We sterilize the loop and continue with the last organism. In the clinical lab, you may be inoculating a whole range of selective and differential media at the same time. It is important to remain organized and carefully label everything. The last plate is inoculated with Staphylococcus epidermidis and the tests must now be incubated overnight. When observing for pathogenic species, remember the optimum growth temperature will be 37 degrees centigrade. The plates are inverted and stacked for incubation. Here are the results for the selective and differential media. Sometimes it's easier to observe your plates using a light box. First, we must look at the control to determine that all of the organisms were viable. Staph aureus, E. coli and Staphylococcus epidermidis were all able to grow on the non-selective plate. Now we look at the mannitol salt. The results here indicate that Staph aureus could grow and could ferment the mannitol. Now we look at the McConkie. Here only the E. coli could grow, the other organisms were inhibited, and E. coli could ferment lactose. The last plate is the blood plate. It is not selective, but it is differential for the production of a hemolysis. Hemolysis is observed only with the Staph aureus. You can see the line where the red blood cells have been destroyed. This is an example of beta hemolysis. How to differential biochemical tests. This section will contain two videos, one covering carbohydrate fermentation tests and the last covering the catalase test. Carbohydrate fermentation tests can be performed on many different sugars. The test will determine whether or not organisms can grow utilizing this carbohydrate. Here you see the media phenyl red dextrose. The test tube contains an inverted Durham tube which will capture any gases such as carbon dioxide produced during the fermentation of the dextrose sugar. A control must always be run with a carbohydrate fermentation test to determine that the organisms were viable and capable of growing in a non-selective control media. Begin the test by labeling all of the tubes to be used. We'll test Staph aureus on the left and E. coli on the right. Loosen all of the caps ready for inoculation. Start by sterilizing your loop and then you will proceed to aseptically inoculate both a control and a carbohydrate ferment test tube with each organism. Staph aureus is used first. Remove a small amount of growth. Aseptically remove the lid from the control tube. Inoculate. Heat the neck of the tube and replace the cap. It's good working practice 
to sterilize the loop between each inoculation. Return to the Staph aureus, remove another sample, and now inoculate the fermentation tube. The inverted Durham tube is about halfway down the main test tube. Inoculate in the broth above the Durham tube. Replace the cap and insert the tube safely into the rack. Repeat the control inoculation and phenol red dextrose inoculation for E. coli. Remember, when an organism utilizes a carbohydrate and catabolizes it to produce energy, it may or may not utilize a fermentation pathway to do this. Fermentation pathways are characterized by the production of waste products such as acid and gas. In the carbohydrate fermentation tests, the presence of acid will be indicated after growth by a color change in the media. Phenol red is a pH indicator in this tube. When the organism grows and utilizes dextrose, if it is using a fermentation pathway to do so, acid will turn the phenol red yellow. Also, you may be able to determine if the fermentation has produced gas by production being captured in the Durham tube. Loosen the caps before incubating. Carbohydrate fermentation tests are usually incubated for 24 to 48 hours at an appropriate temperature for the growth of the organism to be tested. Here you see the results for E. coli and Staph aureus which were demonstrated in the inoculation slide. On the left, we have the control for E. coli, followed by the uh, phenol red dextrose test for E. coli. Then we have the Staph aureus control, followed by the fermentation test for Staph aureus. If we look at the E. coli tubes first, all the tubes have been agitated to resuspend growth. This is essential and your first step. The control is demonstrating turbidity and therefore E. coli was healthy and viable when we inoculated with it. Now we move to the E. coli fermentation test result. It is easy to see that the tube has changed from the bright red color to a yellow orange. This will indicate that acid has been produced by the organism and therefore is a positive fermentation result. Acid is produced as a byproduct of a fermentation reaction, which was utilizing and catabolizing the carbohydrate in this tube. The second differential result for the E. coli is to observe is there any gas in the Durham tube. In this Durham tube, you can easily see a large bubble of gas. That was the second differential result. So E. coli was positive for both acid and gas production. Now we move to the Staph aureus tubes. Again, we start with the control. Was the organism viable? Could it grow in the control non-selective media? The answer, yes, it could. The media in the control is turbid. There is growth. We move to the carbohydrate fermentation tube for Staph aureus. Again, we can clearly see that fermentation has taken place as indicated by a color change in the pH indicator. The phenol red is the pH indicator. We've gone from red to this orange yellow color again. Acid was produced, a positive fermentation result. 
Now we look at the differential result from the Durham tube. In this instance with Staph aureus, there is no evidence of gas production. So it was negative for that aspect of the test. Once we've interpreted all of the test tubes, we dispose of the tubes and they are autoclaved. The catalase test is a differential biochemical test used to identify organisms which produce the enzyme catalase. This enzyme is capable of neutralizing the toxic oxygen product, hydrogen peroxide. It will split hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. The test is easy to perform using a sterile transfer pipette place a single drop of hydrogen peroxide 3% onto clean labeled slides e coli and staph aureus will be tested in this video e coli is on the left Staph aureus on the right. Any excess hydrogen peroxide can be disposed of in the liquid waste and the transfer pipette is placed in the autoclave bag. To remove the samples from your specimens, do not use a metal loop. Instead, use an applicator of wood or paper. Aseptically, Swipe the applicator across the area of growth. You need to pick up a large number of cells. The more cells you have, the more potential enzyme will be present and the faster the reaction. Simply resuspend the cells in the hydrogen peroxide. If catalase is present, bubbles of oxygen will form immediately. Repeat for your next specimen. Resuspend the cells in the hydrogen peroxide and observe for the production of oxygen. E. coli is catalase positive. On the top slide, bubbles are being produced. In the panel on the right, you will see E. coli again on the top slide. An alternative way to perform the test is to add hydrogen peroxide directly to a culture plate. There are more cells on the culture plate and therefore the evidence of oxygen production is clearer. The bubbles can be seen forming quickly.